uh, in the school district of the Chathams. My name is Mike Lasusa. I'm the superintendent of schools. Uh, special welcome to all of our students and also all the folks who are coming from other communities. We're happy that you were uh, able to make your way through the rain and join us tonight. Um, I'd like to thank uh, just a couple of people really quickly. Uh, first of all, our, our technical crew that, that's helping us out, uh, Connor Henderson, John Latona, and the folks at Blink Now. I'd like to thank our assistant superintendent, Karen Chase, whose idea it was to reach out and send an email to Maggie uh, Doyne in, in hopes that we would get lucky and have her come to the district. Seems to have worked out so far. No pressure, Maggie. Um, and of course, special thank you to the Chatham Education Foundation. Uh, the Chatham Education Foundation is uh, the organization in our community that makes this night possible. For four years now, we've been inviting speakers uh, to the district uh, to try to um, shine some light for our students and our parents and our community on attributes and qualities uh, that maybe we overlook sometimes in schools when we're focusing on, on academic and cognitive traits, uh, but that uh, can lead to fulfillment and, um, and richness in life that maybe isn't always measured uh, in conventional ways. And I think our speaker tonight, of course, exemplifies that. Uh, so I, as I was coming here, I was trying to think of a, a decent way to introduce Ms. Doyne because I know if you're sitting here, you probably know quite a bit about her, or at least enough uh, to know what she's accomplished. Uh, and I thought about my high school baseball coach, actually, who uh, before games in which we were facing an intimidating opponent or pitcher on the mound would say, they put their pants on one leg at a time. And it might not seem applicable, but... One of the reasons I'm so excited and feel so grateful uh, that Maggie agreed to come here to speak is that she really was, 10 years ago or so, like so many of our students in Chatham. Uh, the students that are sitting here, the students that are in our schools every day. Uh, she was a good student. She worked hard. She was on a path to a four-year college. She played sports. Uh, she was the typical, uh, if you can use a word like that, Mendham High School or Chatham High School student. And there was something inside of her that um, allowed her uh, to change course and do something different and change the world. And she literally changed the world. <laughs> it's remarkable. Uh, so I think the lesson uh, is that we all probably have some capacity uh, inside ourselves to do something uh, greater, greater than us, great, bigger than us. Uh, and what better person to, to, uh, to share her story about doing that and making that a reality uh, than Miss Maggie Doyne. So I'm just delighted, thrilled, uh, very happy that you're here to join us, and I'd like to welcome to the stage Miss Maggie Doyne. You're welcome. Hi, everybody. I, um, I said on my way here that it was a rainy night and I thought 10 people would come. And <laughs> I'm so thrilled to see such a full audience of happy, beautiful faces. And I thank you for coming out on a cold, rainy night like tonight. Um, it means a lot to me. And uh, yeah, an interesting fact about me and Chatham, I grew up in Mendham. I went to Mendham High up the road a little bit, a very similar community. But about a year ago, I moved to Chatham, Borough. Um, so I'm a new, recent uh, Chathamite. Is that what you call it in Chatham? We say Mendemites. Um, but I, so I'm new to the community. Um, when I'm here in the States, I have a little apartment uh, right off of Main Street, a nice little home base for me and the kids while they're on student exchange programs and while I'm back and forth. So you will see me at um, Power Flow Yoga and uh, Yo of Love. That's my favorite go-to place um, every now and again. And it's just so wonderful. This community has been so, so good to me. What a special place. I've never felt more safe, more welcome, more loved. Um, we're very, very lucky to live here, aren't we? Um, so looking out into the audience, I see kids. I see friends. I see people who have followed my journey for years since I was 17 and 18 years old. I think there's people who know everything about me and are so tired of seeing the Blink Now Facebook feed and Maggie Doyne popping up all the time. <laughs> um, and then there's probably some people, and I know there's some kiddos especially, who don't know anything at all. Um, so I wanted to start this evening 
with a little video that one of my dear, dear, dearest friends made, Susie Becker, who's also here tonight, um, about the whole journey of how a Mendham girl gets to Nepal. So I'm going to play that for you. And then um, I was thinking I want tonight just to be about storytelling and my journey and questions and conversation. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some fun and we'll leave feeling inspired. Thank you. I believe our generation is really going to change things and we're going to create the world that we want to live in. When I was about 18 years old, I was a student at Mendham High School and I woke up one morning and realized that if I went to school right away, I, I wouldn't be ready. As much as I knew about like the outside world and learning and being a good student, I really realized that I didn't know a whole lot about myself. Dreams have never left her I decided that I wanted to take a trip and do some service work throughout the world. And I joined a program called Leap Now and I set out on a gap year. A lot of countries later, and still with my little backpack, I ended up getting a volunteer position at a school in India, in the Northeast. I started to meet refugee families and refugee children. I got to know them and really came to love them. I asked a lot of questions about why all of these kids were coming to India and fleeing their homes and their villages in the Himalayas. At the time, I didn't even know that Nepal was a country. There had been a civil war going on for about 10 years. Children had been orphaned as a result of disease and war, were fleeing the country and in search for a better life in India. So many kids were coming into our project in India that I became really curious and I decided that I really wanted to take a trip to Nepal. I planned a trip with a friend of mine. She had left Nepal in her village about eight years earlier and had never returned. We got on a bus for about two days and then we had to walk a couple days through the Himalayan mountains. I fell in love with this country. People really opened up their hearts and I felt so much at home. At the same time, it was the most eye-opening experience because I saw poverty and women and children in these situations that I just didn't even know existed in the world. For the first time in my life, I understood what it meant to be an orphan and what it looked like to live in a post-war ravaged country. What amazed me the most was that these people still had hope. Dreams have never I met a lot of children who had lost their entire families and were living on their own. I just fell in love with their bright eyes and their smiles. Time has flown. Time has flown. Through my travels in Nepal, I realized that there was something there for me to do. Soon after, I called up my parents and asked them to send me over my entire life savings. I was a babysitter growing up, and I had saved about $5,000 from the time I was, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old. After a very long conversation, my parents sent over my life savings, and I bought a piece of land on the outskirts of a really beautiful village, just a really small piece. My goal was to build a home for the children who didn't have anywhere to live and had lost their families. Children everywhere are the same. They want the same things, love and education and the ability to learn and friendship. In the beginning, I was really overwhelmed. Nepal is a country where the UN estimates there's one million orphaned and abandoned children. 
that's a number that I couldn't even begin to grasp or understand. It overwhelmed me. I spent a lot of time just angry that I had spent my whole life growing up and not knowing what kind of poverty and sadness existed in the world. But I got over it when I met a young girl named Hima who was working and living on the side of a dry riverbed, breaking stones for a living. And she would take big stones and boulders from this dry river, carry them up to the side of the riverbed, and break them into small pieces. She would sell them at the end of the day. She'd gather a, a big bag and she'd sell them for about a dollar. And she used that money to feed her family and take care of her younger siblings and her single mother. And every day when I crossed over, she would say, Namaste, which means hello. And I thought, what if I just started with this one little girl, with this one child? What would happen if I put her into school? How would her life change if she became educated? And I went and I met a principal, I met local village leaders and local townspeople, and they all said the same thing. We want our children to be educated, but the problem is we can't pay the money that it takes, and a lot of these kids need to support their families. So I thought, I can put one child into school. I paid Hema's tuition, and I got her a school uniform and a set of books. The admission fee was less than $7. Okay, even though I'm only 19, I can do that. I started with just one child, and I put her into school and watched as her life was transformed. The thing about this kind of work is that it gets really addicting after a while, and what started with one child soon became five, and then 10, and then 20. I had this dream to build a home for the kids that not only needed a place to go to school every day and become educated, but didn't have food or a bed to sleep in or a place that they could call home. I didn't have any money left and I went home. In the beginning, I think I was convinced I could keep babysitting and babysit my way to building <laughs> Copula Valley. I talked to people in my community, my high school, my middle school. Before I knew it, I had raised about $20,000 and I came back and I finished what would soon become Copula Valley Children's Home. So today there's 220 students enrolled in our program. They come every day. We have local teachers that come in and teach them how to read and write. There's a clinic where they get health care and their basic medical needs met. And they get a nutritious meal every day at school. Almost all of the 220 kids that come every day are the first of their family to become educated. When I come back to my community here in New Jersey and the U.S., I talk to students and to young people and I tell them, hey, look, we can change the world. If we don't like the things that we see anywhere, we can change them. I really love what I do. I'm in love with the children that I live with. They've changed my life. They bring me the greatest joy. It's really hard work sometimes. There are days where I feel sad, but all I usually have to do is walk out my bedroom door and see 30 children running around and realize that hope and, and change and everything is happening right before my eyes. And I see that in the faces of my children. My main message has been to really follow our hearts and find what it is that we love to do and then bring that to the world. I think we all have something really special to give and I've found that and I feel like it's my obligation now to teach young people that they can do the same thing. It doesn't even mean you have to move 8,000 miles away or go to a village in the middle of Nepal. There's so much to do everywhere around us if we just open up our eyes and start to see it.
Yeah, so that's um, that's the entire story. Um, I, you can tell I was I was much younger, <laughs> uh, but just to give you a little update on what's happened since that video was taped, I'm currently the mom to 50 kids. Um, I know I look so good, right? Because <laughs> um, 30 wasn't enough. I just had to keep going. Uh, and there's not a single child breaking stone in that dry riverbed um, where Hema was working. They are all enrolled into Coppola Valley School where we have nearly 400 students today. Um, so we've had a lot of, made a lot of really good progress and a lot of really good things have happened and um, a lot of challenges and a lot of heartbreak too. Um, but yeah, we've been able to come so far. And the reason why Coppola Valley and that community and all of the improvements exist, if you want to know the real truth, it is because of community. And it's because of the place that I came from and the gifts that I was given in a school district like this, in a community like this. And um, so for the kids in the audience, really think about that. Think about um, all of those millions of kids who their biggest, biggest wish in the entire universe is to go to school. And we've been given that. We got that wish. Um, so I always say, really seriously take it um, as that gift, as that lottery pick that you won, and use your gifts and bring them to the world. Because as you know, the world really needs us right now. Um, so about today, I was thinking I would tell um, three stories and, uh, and also tell you a little bit about the growth of Coppola Valley, the model, how it works, um, and then kind of just end with a message because it's the holidays and it's a really special time of year for everyone. So I wanted to tell you about the biggest mistake I ever made um, in my entire life. <laughs> um, my house of teenagers and my oldest daughter who just went to college can you believe that I have a kid in college? <laughs> I just turned 30 last week, by the way, like two weeks ago. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to tell you about college drop-off. There were a lot of tears. Um, and then I want to tell you the story of a grandmother goat. <laughs> that's that's going to be our night. Um, <laughs> And a little bit about grief and healing, because that's um, sort of the personal journey that I've been on. And I can't come here tonight without talking about that. Um, so to start with the biggest mistake of my entire life, um, this is for the high schoolers in the audience. I was the typical Mendham kid. I had a boyfriend who was a football player. <laughs> And I, um, I played on the soccer team. I played basketball. I played lacrosse. I just did everything. My, I, I wanted to be involved in absolutely everything. I was the president of every club. I was the treasurer of my class for four years. I was just like this such a Mendham kid with the same exact face and so eager and wanting to learn and wanting to be a part of everything. Um, and... I, that was me, like if you can picture that type of kid. Um, I took really hard classes, and uh, you know how this area is, right? You, <laughs> you get to be a junior and a senior, and what does everybody ask you? Where are you going to college? Where are you going to college? What schools did you get into? Where are you applying? Um, and I was that kid that literally had like a C on my forehead, college, right? Like, like that's, that's kind of what we think about when we think of girls with ponytails in Mendham and Chatham. They go to college. They, what school are they going to? Where did they get in? Is it a big name school like BC? Is it an Ivy? Is it like, what tier is it on? Um, and so I think that those values of getting into a college and getting on the right tracks, so you can get the right jobs, that you can be successful and, and yada, 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 make a lot of money, take care of yourself, take care of your family. I think that that was really instilled in me at a very young age in this, in this pressure cooker um, that I call Morris County. <laughs> 
Um, so that was me, right? Like, I was taught from the time that I was in seventh grade that you had to get A's and you had to get a score on the, your SATs and you have to get a tutor so that you can get the score and you have to get a college person who can help make your application look better. You know what it's like, I have a feeling. Um, so everything that I did, like IB, uh, everything that I did was with this destination of college. Um, and my lacrosse team, I came to my senior year, I applied to schools, I got into some, I didn't get into others. Uh, I was playing in the Morris County finals of lacrosse. Um, I was like putting together the prom. It was the year end, it was when everybody was kind of like getting ready to commit to schools and I still hadn't committed and I still hadn't committed. And I woke up one day um, and I'll never forget this moment. I walked downstairs and I had pulled an all-nighter studying for like an IB exam or an AP test, something. And I just had this feeling and this knowing in my gut and in my core that if I went to college that it would be for all the wrong reasons. And I, um, I just felt like I needed to see more and do more and that I had been so focused and like working for these goals and to try to like build this person that I didn't even know anymore who I was on the inside. That's kind of the, the best way to describe it. It was just this feeling of I need to figure out who I am before I go and I make this huge financial commitment, this life commitment with my parents' money, with all of this. It was just this feeling of like, um, I, don't, I can't, I'm not ready to do this. Well, so then you know you like go to King's <laughs> and every single, every down, every aisle down the grocery store, everyone's like, where are you going to college? And it was this big, like I had so much fear and so much anxiety, but I also had this knowing that it just wasn't, the, I had to do something. I wanted to step out and, and open up a little bit. So it was this, it was a really big deal at the time. Now I look back and think, why are you so stressed? But I do know what that feels like. Um, I really do. I, I was that kid. Um, so I decide that I'm not going to go to college and I'm going to take, um, I'm going to take a year off and I'm going to travel the world and I want to join a program and just see what learning feels like outside of the four walls of the classroom. Find myself, figure out what I want to study before I go and spend a bajillion dollars on it. And I, um, I'm in my senior year biology class and my name gets called out over the loudspeaker, please report to guidance. And I thought, oh my gosh, my name never got called out over the loudspeaker. That's like what the bad kids, that's what happens to the bad kids. Like you get a slip and then you get called down to the office and why are they pulling me out of class? What's happened? Well, I go down and I report to guidance, and not only is it my guidance counselor, but it's the director of guidance. So they've pulled in the big guns. And they say, we heard that you're taking a deferral, that you're not, that you're not going to college right away. What are you doing? You, you've worked so hard for this. This is everything that we've worked for. You got in. Um, and I said something along the lines of really scared and intimidated. Yeah, I just don't feel like, it's right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go next year, maybe. Um, <laughs> but I know that I'm going to change this year and I'm not ready to commit. And my guidance counselor looked at me in the eye and she said, you're making the biggest mistake of your entire life. And this was the biggest mistake. Um, so just, I wanted to tell that story because all of us fall into this trap um, we get stuck in the fear and the not knowing of what's in front of us and, and thinking that I have to do this so I can be this person, so I can do that, so I can, so I can build all of these things for what I'm supposed to be. But that is not necessarily the thing that brings you joy and happiness and meaning. And um, I see that in our generation. I see that in parents. And I see us all biting that hook of 
where are you going? What are you doing? You have to be someone. And sometimes the biggest mistake of your entire life could be the step that takes you to where you are and where you're meant to be. Um, so that's my little story <laughs> about, about uh, that. And if you're that parent that's like putting a lot of pressure on your kids, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and really, truly consider a gap year program because it changed my life. And we should be doing college in the reverse. And education is not in a box. It's not in a, in a classroom always, in the four walls. It, it can be so many things. And um, I've learned a lot in these 10 years. Um, my next story, I'll talk a little bit about the model and how how sort of it started with the children's home and then grew into this whole sort of community development movement. Um, I was traveling and I really, really hated orphanages. I hated them. Um, I was volunteering in different projects and seeing different orphanages and oftentimes a child is actually more likely to die of an infectious illness um, or be worse off inside of these facilities. Oh, many times children are trafficked, they're not fed well. Um, you know, you even hear the word orphanage and it feels kind of like icky just to even say it. You think of this like dark room with um, like slop or oatmeal getting put onto a plate. Um, and that's really truly what orphanages, most orphanages in the world are. And that's what I was seeing and I was so young and I really just felt like I was so young that I thought, I can do it better. Um, and I was started with enrolling children into school and then realized that a lot of these kids didn't even have that luxury of being able to go to school because they didn't have a home, they didn't have food. And like I said in the video, the, it was like a means to an end of just making that money, breaking rocks, and giving it back to the family. Everybody's in survival mode, so an education is just like above and beyond anyone's wildest dreams. So then sort of that evolved into this idea of a children's home. And um, I started going through the process of forming an NGO. I have a huge, amazing team. It's not just me. I have a, um, a huge mega team here, uh, amazing folks in New Jersey, and then a staff of about 100 people running all of our different programs on the ground. So I um, started with the children's home, and then things sort of spun out. Like, all of the kids were going to a school that was in the city, and there was corporal punishment in Nepal still. So my daughter got a math problem wrong, and she got slapped across the face. And, you know, they give the kids a stick and kind of, like, beat them so that they get the problems right. And I was trying to work within the system. And then I was enrolling so many street children into school that I really wanted them under one roof so I could do things like school lunch and provide them with medical care. Because you realize when you try to enroll a child just into school and giving them that uniform that they really need more. They need the whole package in order to be successful. So then that was how the school evolved. Um, and once we had the school, we were um, taking in kids. Every single year, we have about 1,000 children who apply. And in order to apply, you have to be missing parents or in really, really difficult circumstances. Um, and we, we were only taking in a really selective amount. Um, so we get these really, <laughs> I mean, desperate, struggling kids into school. And we teach them how to use a toilet for the first time and how to flip the light switch. I mean, all of these things are really, really new, not to mention the ABCs and learning how to read and write. Um, many of our students are actually the first in their generation to be able to go to school. Um, and, and just to give an idea of what that looks like, not a single woman above the age of 25 to 30 can even hold a pen and write her own name on, a, say, a bank account, to open a bank account. No, they can't read signboards. And when that happens, um, it really kind of doesn't work on the development and growth of a community because we know that women are the caregivers. So, so the whole idea of a school arises, and we're like generating the first 
literate and these amazing kids who are reading and writing and developing curriculum and, and doing everything that goes into a school, but then you realize that the kids who are coming into school, they, you know, they live in really bad situations at home and they're drinking dirty water, so they can't come to school because they're getting infections and they're getting you know, like really, really sick from dirty water. So you open up a medical clinic so that you keep the kids healthy and you do health awareness and hygiene workshops and give out water filters. Um, and then you realize that kids aren't coming to school because they're really hungry. Like they don't have food to eat at home and they're really just trying to get fed. So you start a nutrition program and every single day, the kids get a nice, warm school lunch with heaping, heaping piles of food, and your attendance goes up. Um, but then <laughs> you realize that years pass, and you, and you realize that um, the women who are the caregivers in these children's homes and the community are being abused, and they have you know, so many issues at home that the child's home life is really compromised and they're exposed to violence and really bad situations. Fathers um, who aren't present or get drunk and light their daughter's backpack on fire. I mean, just really, really bad violent situations. So we started a women's center um, to combat this and to educate women and give them a means to have skills and generate their own income. So this is sort of how our program evolved. It was very organic. It was very like fly by the seat of our pants a little bit, but do, do some research, see a problem, and then combat it. And that's kind of what I've learned about community development, that you can't just solve you know, one problem. These issues are so interlaced and it's like a web. And in order to really develop and bring up and develop a community and educate a generation of children, it really takes the whole picture. It takes the government, it takes the local community, the elders, it takes the women, it takes the clean water, the hygiene, it takes the literacy, um, it takes the healthy food. And that's sort of how this program developed and that's how we got the community support. And I really do think that community and this organic process of looking at issues and solving them little by little is why Coppola Valley um, has been really successful. Um, so back to my goat. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I noticed was that children in orphanages didn't have really practical skills um, in order to be successful upon sort of transition and age out. And so um, I really, from day one, wanted the children to be growing their own food and farming and having really, really practical skills that could carry them forward into their lives. So we always had goats and chickens around. And I started the first ever turkey farm in Nepal just for Thanksgiving. And um, that's, it was, it's very much sort of this grow your own food, be as sustainable as possible. Um, so there was this old grandmother goat, and we recently bought land. We're building this sustainable farm so that we can generate everything, like all of our own food and, and be, you know, a more self-sustaining organization. And we were like, let's go buy some goats. So goats are one of the best ways that you can help a farmer and develop a community. Um, and they're really cost effective, so you buy them and, and raise them, and then you have meat, you have milk. So we go, we go to look for goats, and we buy like the, really, the little male and the little female, and we're choosing our goats. And um, there's one really old looking goat. Um, her udders were like dragging on the ground. Her ears were droopy, and one of her ears had been bitten off. And my team and I were like, we need to get that grandmother goat. Um, we can't just take the cute, like, strong goats. We should get her, too. She's had a hard life. Like, let's, <laughs> let's help this grandmother goat. So we get her, and we name her Baze Bakari, which means grandmother goat. We speak Nepali, all of us. Um, so we name her grandmother goat, and she's so sweet. She becomes, like, a really treasured member of the family. 
But my Nepali staff, who are all farmers, they've all grown up farming, just look at us and, the, and they're like, you're so, you're so American. Like, you're so New Jersey, you got cheated and spent all that money on an old grandmother goat. And so they were just like laughing and we were like, that's okay, it's fine. She's just a grandmother, like goat. So I go over to our farm and it's a huge construction project. We're building a school right now. It's gonna be one of the greenest schools in the whole world. And there's like hammering, we're doing rammed earth architecture, the walls are going up. And I see grandmother goat tied up to a post eating the grass to cut the lawn. And I say to my Nepali team, grandmother goat looks really big. Like, she's big, like she's, is she, and they were like, no, 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 she's just eating a lot. Um, and I'm like, okay, but she looks like wide. She looks kind of like she could be pregnant. And they're like, ha ha, that's really funny. You bought an old goat. There's no way that she's pregnant. Two weeks later, she gets bigger. Anyway, long story short, grandmother goat delivered triplets. And now they always have me choose the animals <laughs> because <laughs> we, got <laughs> we got some real bang for our buck, like a $100 investment turned into a $400 investment overnight. And they were like, oh, poor grandmother goat. She had triplets. She's so old. She'll die, like just delivering them. Next, a couple months later, she gets pregnant with twins. And, and um, so that's my little Jersey girl story of getting made fun of and then being the best animal predictor of all time. Uh, we recently also bought two cows and later found out they were pregnant. And they both had female, um, female cows, which was really lucky because we get extra milk. And we're now the proud owners of four cows and like a bajillion goats. Um, <laughs> So just a little story about farming and sustainability and sort of the model of, and my approach, my team's approach to how we go about impacting this community. And Coppola Valley is where we want to be forever. Um, we're really not the kind of organization that goes and builds schools and does pop-up shows. We really believe in getting deep, deep rooted into a community and raising children. And that's what we always say we're in. We're in the business of like raising kids. We're not about just giving out a toothbrush or doing that one operation that the child needs. We're really about looking at the whole child and developing these children to be contributing members to society and change makers and leaders so that we address the violence and the poverty in our world and raise these kids to be loved and cared for. Um, and I really, see that when I look at the world and the state that we're in, I just look at the violence and I immediately think this goes back to children who have not been cared for and loved. And I truly believe in my heart and I know it because I've seen it and I've raised kids that came off the streets and you're like, that kid doesn't have a prayer. And they, sure enough, every single one has turned into the most amazing human being. Um, and I just never give up. And I always say, if you're going to start somewhere, start with children and start with education. Because I really, truly believe that once we care for a generation of children and we love them and we give them everything they need, we're going to see a lot of change in our world. And I really truly believe that we can create the world that we want to live in. Um, and so that's why I do what I do. And that's why I come. I was so afraid to come and talk, but I realized that I have to do this because we have to join hands and spread this message um, of change together because it's like a ticking time bomb. We just, we don't have time on our side. Children are being raised. Um, not making it past the age of five because of, you know, starvation, not being educated, becoming trafficked, or becoming a child laborer. Those statistics are real, and they're my children. Those are the children that you see up on that screen. And it's so, it's such a little intervention at the right time that can really change the life um, of a child. So I thank you for your, for your supporting me in that. Um, so my, my last story was about Nisha. Um, 
my oldest. Um, I adopted Nisha when she was six years old, and um, she had lost both of her parents within about six months of each other, and um, was working as a domestic servant, which is really common for girls who are orphaned. You know, they get put in someone else's home to work, which obviously leads to um, really serious issues, things like child marriage and um, bad things. So Nisha um, comes in. She was the first ever child who came into Coppola Valley, and she was just this bright-eyed, beautiful, really smart, really hardworking kid. She just learned English in like two seconds, like walking down the road, tree, and I didn't speak in Nepali yet, and she'd come back tree and cow and toothbrush, like I just learned everything really quickly. Within a year, she was aged up by two classes, a kid that had never been to school before. Um, within three years, she was reading the Harry Potter series. Um, and by the time she was in eighth grade, she got a scholarship to go to the Peck School in Morristown. Mm -hmm. And um, and is just the most hardworking. Um, she's kind of like the mother hen because she's the oldest of fifty kids. She said when she was applying to college, um, she came to me and she was really teary eyed and she said, "Mom." I just don't want to have to talk about my story. She was writing um, a college essay. And, uh, you know, I think someone told her, your college essay should be like your story of what happened to you and how you get, came to be who you are. And she came to me teary and said, I just don't want to go into that. I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to talk about my story in my essay or my interview. And I was like, that's okay. You don't have to talk about your story or what happened to you or what happened to your parents. That's, that's your story. Um, and so a couple weeks later, she comes back, and she gives me her essay to read. And um, <sighs> um, the first line of the essay was, I'm the oldest of 50 kids, the oldest of mine. <laughs> and the start of the story was um, her story of becoming the oldest sister of 50 siblings and our family. Anyway, we were on um, this... She lost both of her parents to illness, and she dreamed of being a doctor. And we appeared on a Dutch TV show, this woman, Florja, and she's like the Oprah of Holland. <laughs> and we we're on this like kind of like travel reality TV show. And Nisha got interviewed, and they said that um, she wanted to be a doctor and t told her story. And uh, Nisha got a full scholarship to United World College um, and is currently in the Netherlands uh, studying and just doing so well. I'm going to see her in a couple of weeks. She's coming back for Christmas break. And, um, and she did go to college. <laughs> so I can't tell the story. <laughs> I can't tell the story of not going to college because <gasps> now my oldest one. <laughs> um, so I, I've, I dropped her off this summer um, in the Netherlands. It was so hard. It was impossibly hard to do and uh, it just felt like such a reality check like oh my gosh you were just I feel like you were just like six and seven years old how did this happen um, and I I talked about like all my friends when they were um, going to college like really feeling like I was missing out on something when they were packing up the dorm room and going to Target and buying all the stuff for school and uh, and then I was like thinking when we were going to Target and packing up all the stuff to go to school, I did get to go to college in a way. I got to get ready for the dorm room. And uh, I didn't think it would happen this way, but it happened, and it happened through her. Um, I'm just so proud of her. I wanted to tell that little ending of the college story so that I wouldn't be standing up here telling people not to go. <laughs> um, so that's the story about Nisha. Um, and I guess kind of what I wanted to end with is that, yeah, like my biggest mistake, um, you really never know what's ahead of you. Um, you just never know what is going to happen tomorrow, what will come knocking on your door. I'm coming off of a year of the worst tragedy of my entire life. 
Um, and it, and I'm still standing. Actually, my goal in coming here today, my boyfriend is here, said, what are you talking about? And I was like, I don't know. My goal is really just to get up on the stage and, and talk. Um, and I'm going to tell a few stories. And, uh, but that was my goal for today, was just see if you can get up on stage. Just see if you can stand up. It's Chatham. You live here. You can do this, Maggie. Come on. Um, and I think when I look back at my life, every single day has been putting on one pant leg at a time. That's so true. You really start just with every single day with what's in front of you and with solving those problems day to day and taking it step by step and standing up when you don't think you can and getting out of bed when you think it's impossible. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I am very much on a healing journey and I'm doing so well. Um, and I think what I wanted to end with today is how I said on Thanksgiving, I never thought in a million years I would ever feel grateful again. Um, and then gratitude was the thing that saved me. It was really, truly feeling grateful for every single moment. And as we go into the holiday season, um, yeah, I just want us all to really savor like the place that we live. Um, the fact that we're going out in the rain with an umbrella and getting into cars that drive, like we have cars here. Um, and if you have a fireplace, like cozying up in front of your fire and making a cup of tea. And um, I think that you'll find that when you really take every single moment and every single thing that's in front of you and just value it and appreciate it and know that we don't know what's around the corner, that our lives will really, truly change and transform. And um, I've taken...